start the second session of the day. We have three papers. Uh, first, we have Professor Richard Pring uh, talking on aims of education, philosophical issues for educational research, followed by P Professor Robin Barrow, who teaches at Simon Fraser University, Canada. The title of his presentation is Empirical Research in Education, Why Philosophy Matters. And we have Professor Padma Sarangapani, who teaches at uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, talking on learning culture. And this session will be uh, chaired by Professor Dennis Phillips. First of all, um, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. This is my first visit to India, and I hope it won't be my uh, last, because uh, apart from the marvelous occasion, it's so good now to see the sun again and blue skies, uh, and everybody smiling, as opposed to everybody looking miserable in England, and it's raining and wet and so on. So thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, the uh, title of my paper is The Aims of Education, Philosophical Issues for Education Research. And in so doing, uh, I really cover some of the issues and reinforce, I hope, that have been raised right through the, uh, uh, the uh, series of lectures and uh, papers, uh, uh, but also want to add quite a little bit about this notion of teachers as researchers, because I think that's crucial to uh, teaching improvement and the role of philosophy and so on uh, in this. And I really want to <coughs> stress, I think, the, uh, some of the, the problems and issues that uh, uh, Chris Winch uh, raised uh, and the importance, really, of actually justifying and seeing the purpose of uh, philosophy of uh, education. Uh, and I think it does need constantly to be defended. I think there was a time, certainly in Britain, uh, when uh, it, it flourished. And that there are particular reasons why it did flourish. Uh, one was the creation of the B.Ed. degree in the 1960s uh, and the change of what we call training colleges to colleges of education, indicating that really we need to do more than train teachers. We need to give them that underlying capacity to think seriously about the purpose of education, about what they're doing, and all the things connected uh, with it. So the B.Ed. degree did that, and as a result of that, there was the work of Richard Peters, as frequently been mentioned, who uh, famously said in 1962 that the job of the philosophy of education is to get rid of the mush in educational uh, theory. All the kind of silly things uh, that people say, we need a much more stricter more philosophically disciplined way of thinking about education. And there was the growth of the diploma courses and the master's courses, and so all these various colleges of education around the country needed people to teach philosophy, and it was a really flourishing uh, kind of business. But, as Chris has referred to, one is now seeing, actually, the demise of that. The fact is, we don't really want people to be thinking too much in those sort of terms. And this then brings the importance of arguing for philosophy education very much onto the uh, uh, political uh, agenda. Uh, and um, I say onto the political agenda because we are seeing, as Chris pointed out, uh, actually a suspicion of the fact that people, teachers are encouraged to think more deeply about what they're doing, because what they are being expected to do is carry out. They've become, to use this phrase, uh, the deliverers of the curriculum, not curriculum uh, thinkers. The curriculum is thought out over there by politicians and so on. It needs to be uh, delivered. What we don't want is that delivery spoilt by these teachers asking questions about the purpose and so on of what they've been asked to deliver. And we shouldn't really be too surprised about that uh, because uh, it always has been the case that to uh, think philosophically uh, about these matters is seen by those who run the systems to be extremely dangerous. Um, the great teacher Socrates was made to take hemlock because his philosophical questioning was seen to corrupt the youth of Athens. John Dewey, who's frequently been referred to, uh, whose democracy in education inspired generations of teachers across the world, was called worse than Hitler by some who felt that he infected schools with epistemological relativism and substituted socialization for true education. Dewey was seen as both a hero and he was hated by many in America as he thought that they, getting teachers to think uh, was not a good thing for the pursuit of education. And if I might take, uh, give an example of this, when I first was appointed in Oxford in 1989 as, dare I say, the first 
Professor of Education in the 600 years history of Oxford University, arriving little me very nervous about whether you call it a serviette or a napkin, whether you wear a gown to dinner or not, uh, how do you drink your port and all that sort of thing. Uh, and I remember my first major dinner at High Table at Oriel College and I thought I was sitting next to Lord Quintot, the great uh, Quinton, the great uh, philosopher, and I thought, look, Pring, you know, uh, just be silent. Look intelligent and be silent. You might get, you might get a rep reputation for being very boring, but you won't get one for being unintelligent. Anyway, I survived the dinner, we went down for the port. I was sitting next to this very fat gentleman, and he turned around to me and he said, and who and what are you, in that typically Oxford manner? And I said, well, I'm Richard Pring, just newly arrived as the uh, uh, Professor of Education at the University of Oxford, and I got what could only be described as an Oxford snort. It was a noise that comes down the right, that right nostril, uh, <laughs> showing total contempt and disdain. So I said, right, you're not going to get away with this, and who and what are you? And he said, Cato. Medievalist. I specialise in the year 1274. Then I knew I was in a place of scholarship. Right. <laughs> so one has constantly had to justify one's position in this august institution. So what is it then to defend this? What is the sort of key issue that one should be thinking about in doing philosophy? What? And I think it is starting with that Socratic question, going through the Socratic dialogues and so on. What do you mean? Take the following statement from my friend, the Secretary of State for Education, Mr. Gove. Our society has not always valued academic achievements as it should. Sorry, uh, our society has not always valued academic achievements as it should. The poor, not that he has ever met any poor, suffered because of the left-wing doctrine that the pursuit of academic excellence was somehow narrowly elitist. The argument for uncompromising emphasis uh, on academic excellence has been won. Tomorrow's A-level results will show we've buried the nonsense about child-centered learning. But this statement depends on the meaning of two key words, academic and child-centered. What do they mean? One aim of philosophy has been to analyze what is meant by central but contestable concept, to undo what Wittgenstein referred to as the bewitchment of the intelligence by the use of language. And by contestable is meant that how we use words, or how words are used, has a history which reflects different assumptions about values to be held, ways of understanding the social and moral worlds that we inhabit, the nature of the mind, and so on. Hence, in asking what do you mean, one is often taken into those traditional fields of philosophical argument, as ethics, epistemology, and philosophy of mind. And this is certainly the case in educational discourse. And I want to just show that through just a few examples. First of all, take academic, as it was used by Mr. Gove. The longer Oxford English Dictionary provides one amongst many several definitions of academic, namely very boring. Now, is Mr. Gove recommending very boring education? Possibly as an excellent preparation for a boring life after school is finished. The point is that as soon as you begin to ask what do you mean by academic, you get into trouble. In much educational uh, talk and political discourse, it's contrasted with the practical. Academic and practical, academic and vocational. But then, are the study of engineering very practical indeed, and design and technology thereby not academic, even though they are intellectually very demanding. And for art to be academically respectable, does it have to become the history of art, thinking theoretically about art, rather than doing or being engaged practically and intelligently in it? That this sort of conceptual muddle has resulted in England in a new English baccalaureate, which ex where you have to take, uh, where six subjects are going to be used as the criteria by which schools are judged to be good or bad, up and down league tables, and so on. But that, in order to foster academic learning, excludes the arts and also design and technology. So one view of the educated person is one who's very good at these academic subjects, but might be totally ignorant and unable in the technical world, in the engineering world, and in the art world. And this is causing now a great deal of trouble from the arts fraternity. Or take the word child-centred. With regard to child-centred, this word has a history, reflecting different understandings and attitudes towards children. Surely, teaching children requires some attention to how children are thinking, 
What's motivating them? What's the social context which determines how they are motivated, think, and so on? Can education be anything other than child-centered? On the other hand, there have been advocates of education arising solely or mainly out of the interests of the child, realizing their potential is the phrase. My grandson Isaac, when he was five, managed to steal my handkerchief from my pocket without my knowing it, putting it down the pring toilet and block, blocking it up. He has the potential to be a very good pickpocket. Do I really want him to realize his potential? And yet, we're, we're using this word education about helping kids to realize their potential. No, that avoids the ethical issues. What sort of potentials do we really want to <clears throat> uh, activate and which uh, don't we? And by the way, it was rescued by his father. Uh, and this is a long time ago. And whenever I go and visit them, I still see his father using my old handkerchief. Uh, but, I think it's, <laughs> but I think it's been washed since then. Anyway, uh, so, so a slight glance at newspapers shows that we have as much potential for evil as we do for good. Child-centered, in that sense, is quite is unacceptable. But was such a notion ever held by the left-wingers who Mr. Goh wants to overcome? In other words, there's a whole emotive meeting, and I th meaning behind here. I mean, I started philosophy uh, reading philosophy, well, actually in a very uh, strange, uh, in, in Rome and so on, it's all in Latin. Anyway, in this what library full of Latin books, I found a book in English, uh, which was a great relief, uh, and it was by A.J. Eyre called Language, Truth and Logic. And so I decided then to come back from Rome and go and study uh, philosophy under A.J. Eyre. Language, Truth and Logic had a terrific influence. Uh, it was basic, the basic thesis was the meaning of any proposition was its mode of verification. In other words, if there's a statement which logically cannot be verified, and by verification he meant by reference either to the principle of contradiction or to what you observe, it's therefore meaningless. All right? So the typical uh, tautological statement was all uh, bachelors are unmarried. True by definition. It was until recently. Now they're legislating the English Parliament for bachelors to marry bachelors. So that uh, is the main objection to uh, Ayer's thesis. Um, but, um, uh, and then the others are these empirical ones. So actually, sitting around in the Commons was very boring, because as soon as you said anything other than bachelors are unmarried, or simple things like, it is raining, I can verify that because I can feel water coming down, uh, you were immediately pounced upon by saying, how do you verify it? So just to sit for three years, I just sat in silence. Um, now, but this, emo therefore, ethical statements, aesthetic statements, were, of course, expressions of emotion, of feeling. I think it's a rather important thing, because there is that emotive thing, and certain phrases now just have that emotive feeling in political discourse, and child-centred, of course, is, is one of them. Or take the notion of standards. Now, every country, or 67 countries, and I presume India is one of them, goes, gets very worried every four years in the anticipation of the OECD's PISA uh, results, which actually show uh, global standards in terms of reading, arithmetic, and, uh, uh, and science. Uh, and uh, where, who's at the top of the table? Always China, of course, uh, and then various people on the way down. And Britain, and the last one became, I think, in reading, something like 28th, in arithmetic 27th, and 21 uh, in science. The consoling thing was we were way above the United States. Now, uh, the point is, this is something very, it's all about standards in schools. The one on uh, uh, reading compares results in 2006 with those in 2009. Uh, and they included in 2009, but not in 2006, the ability to use the language and so on for texting messages, etc. So I would have done very well in 2006, but I would have totally failed in 2009. So what is it about these standards? Who decides these standards? What counts as the appropriate uh, standards? And are standards going up or down, which is the thing? Now, what do we mean by standards? And what could be meant by such standards going up or down? Take, for example, the language I've mentioned, the one on reading capacity. Standards don't go up or down. If the standards go up or go down, it can only be by reference to the standards by which standards are judged to be going up or down. By the same logic, the standard by which standards are judged to go up and down does itself go up or down by according to the standard by which the standard by which standard and so on ad infinitum. By the way, I think I am the only person in the world who has so far discovered the logical flaw in the whole of the PISA exercises. So don't you actually publish it, that's still uh, for me to do. Now, standards change as, educational, as education tries to keep up with the changing social and economic uh, cha uh, challenges. 
Standards cannot go up or down. Rather, it is performance according to agreed standards which go up or down. Standards are the benchmarks against which performance is judged to be good or bad, elegant or crude, intelligent or stupid. But the standards themselves change, not rise or decline, and that change standard relates to the changes in what you think is important. They logically relate to the purpose of the activity. The meaning of educational standards, which underpin much educational research, depends on the aims of education and thus on the values which are embodied in such aims. You cannot decide on what are the standards by which to judge performance without first making explicit what the aims of education are. Standards logically relate to the aims of an activity and to what one means by being educated. We can't dodge that question. It would permeate everything that we do with students and teachers. Therefore, to conclude this little bit, philosophy, as Socrates dem demonstrated, often begins with the question, what do you mean? It's the job of philosophy to scratch beneath the surface of what, you, what are thought to be agreed meanings and to show that our accounts of the world are much more complicated than is often assumed, that our intelligence is bewitched by the misuse of language. Wittgenstein explained, my aim to teach to pass from a piece, my aim is to teach to pass from a piece of disguised nonsense to something that is patent nonsense. And that, in my declining years, is what I am trying to do with Mr. Gove. So education, we've got to go back to that, its meaning and its aim. Much follows, therefore, from the particular use of language, especially when the purposes of education lies in hitting targets, which are defined by politicians and their civil servants. The targets become the standards, Thereby, teachers' activities are directed increasingly to hitting the targets rather than to developing understanding, to teaching to the test. And the empirical evidence here is exceedingly strong. And I'm bringing this out in a, well, a book which has just been published. It's absolutely appalling the way now people are teaching uh, to the test and how textbooks are being written, which if you just follow those textbooks, you can actually score well in the tests. The, lead, you know, the amount of money that Pearson's it now makes for profit from education. And I come now from the airport here and I see the increase in wealth and development in India. I can see how once very soon the for-profit textbook writers are going to be here to show how, how you can improve in the tests. I say beware. <laughs> All right. In recent decades in Britain and the United States, the language of performance management has permeated educational discourse and thereby the language of educational research. The importance attached to raising of standards has led to interest by policymakers and therefore by researchers into the effective school. The school which, if it follows well-researched procedures, will attain the desired results. This in turn has created the science of educational deliverology. A word not yet in the Oxford English Dictionary, but about to go into it, all right? A centre for which has been established in Washington by Sir Michael Barber, once director of delivery uh, for our former Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Blair. How could you possibly go to bed at night saying, I am director of delivery, all right? Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, and delivery doesn't matter. The science of deliver enables you to deliver, deliver test results, deliver health, deliver cornflakes, deliver bubble, bubble gum. It's all one science of delivery. And to think, um, I mean, and now I, I really shouldn't tell this because I once gave a reference for Michael Barber at the beginning of his career. Um, you know, so um, I have had my impact upon education. Uh, and uh, who's now out, having been delivering good education for New York State, uh, is now delivering it uh, for the state of Pakistan. Well, the best of luck. Um, the science of deliverology has the tools whereby teachers might deliver the results, that is, hit the targets, I'm quoting all this, um, which politicians have declared to be the mark of the successful school. As a result, a new language has arisen, a language which would, not have, would have been laughable only a few decades ago. A uh, new language <clears throat> which shapes political discourse about educational standards, teacher discourse about educational practice, and discourse about education research. Thus there needs to be the specification of measurable targets, performance indicators by which attainment of targets is judged, effective delivery of the curriculum, 
by teachers to hit the targets. Teachers, as deliverers of targets, are regularly audited by inspectors to ensure that the targets have been hit and that the consumers, no longer pupils, no longer students, the consumers have the results that they desire. The assumption is that by making public the targets, which have been hit and then translated into school league tables, teachers will strive all the harder so as to compete in the market created by free schools uh, for parents who can now exercise choice. Standards are thereby uh, driven up. This new language of education is very beguiling, but we need to ask whether it has got anything to do with what we mean by educating. If one changes the metaphor from that of performance man management to one which more accurately reflects what it means for people to think, to deliberate, or to engage with other people, then teaching and thereby educating are seen very differently, affecting the nature of educational research. Ends and means are not contingently related. The teacher of literature introduces a book or a play because it embodies the educational values, the feelings, the understandings, the sentiments which are to be internalized and which transform uh, the person. The book or the play is part of the educational conversation between the teacher and the learner, between the learner and that which they are able to be exposed to in literature, in art, and so on, and thereby between the learner and the culture that we have inherited. And I was so delighted at the marvelous uh, example given of the role of drama that was given yesterday in that transforming influence of the youngsters this young woman w was working with. And if I might give a further example of this, a few years ago uh, on our television there was the, uh, the program called Ballyhoo, and it was uh, the English Ballet Company in Birmingham had got together with a great deal of trouble, a great deal of time, about a hundred youngsters whose only qualification for for being there is that finally they were persuaded to be there and had been absolute educational failures, excluded from school, uh, in trouble with the police, working with the youth service, you name it, they had those problems, run away from home. And they managed to persuade them to take part in a ballet. This lot, a ballet, and not just any kind of ballet, it was Prokofiev's uh, Romeo and Juliet. And there they were doing a Shakespearean ballet. Do you know, it was the most incredible success. Those who still had parents around came to see the performance. They'd never been to a theatre before, and they absolutely changed. And there was this marvellous interview with Emma, who had taken the part of Lady Cha uh, uh, Capulet. And the interviewer said, what has this done for you? She said, it's transformed me. Now, this is a woman, girl who'd run away from school, got no qualification, trouble with the police and one another. And they say, oh, it's changed my life. And they said, in what way? She said, I now understand my mum. All right, now, was this an education? Did, would she get a grade A in her examinations? It was the role of drama art. And, of course, the director of the English Ballet at Birmingham said, but, of course, Shakespeare has everything for these young people. Dysfunctional families, street crime, murder, drug taking, one thing or another. Good literature, good plays, as relates to the issues that really confront human beings in their effort to become uh, human. It is through that learning, <clears throat> through, so Michael Oakeshott, spoke of man, therefore, as what he learns to become. This is the human condition. It is through learning what is worthwhile, knowledge and practices of many different kinds, that one learns to live a distinctively human life. Schools ideally give access to deeper and wider reflection on the human condition. Education, therefore, for Oakeshott, is what he refers to as the conversation between the generations of mankind in which they are introduced to the voice of poetry, to the voice of science, to the voice of, of history, to the voice of literature, to the voice of philosophy. Therefore, <clears throat> the metaphor of conversation creates very different expectations from that of hitting targets. One criterion of a good conversation is that you cannot anticipate the outcome. Nobody could have anticipated the outcome from the ballyhoo was that Emma would finally come to appreciate her mum. To do so would not, be to nature, would not be the nature of a serious interaction taking place between the pupil and the culture they are introduced to, between the, the pupil and the teacher, between the pupil and the pupil. There are therefore two aspects of this language of education which I wish to emphasize. First, Peters argued the one logical characteristic of ed to educate is like that of to reform. 
If I talk of reforming someone, I talk about making them somehow for the better. If I reform a criminal, it means that person is no longer a criminal. If I talk about uh, educating a person, as opposed to merely training and instructing them, it is to imply that the learner is in some way transformed for the better by what he or she has learned. He or she has, in Oakshot's sense, come to live a more distinctively human life. At the centre of educational thinking by policymakers and teachers, therefore, must be deliberations of what it means to live a more human life. What is it to be and to become more fully a person? A topic, of course, which has interested philosophers from the very beginning. And what really got me interested in this, particularly, I went out a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago, to work at Harvard with Ron Lawrence Kohlberg, who was mentioned by, I think, and because of his whole development of uh, moral judgment and one thing or another. And David is quite right, you can teach people to be very sophisticated in their moral judgment, but how does that translate into how they act and practice and so on? And Kohlberg saw that sort of problem, and he developed what was called the Just Community School. In other words, if you want children to think in terms of principles of fairness and so on, those have got to be embodied, as it were, in the very life and spirit of the, of the, of the, of the school. And so I went to visit one of these schools. It was uh, Newton High in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there I met this remarkable uh, principal uh, of this school. A large school, about 3,000 pupils, and quite a turnover of teachers, obviously, then, each year. And uh, there she was, this woman, had all these strange tattoos all over it, I thought were tattoos, and so on, blue marks on her arm, and so on. And she said, well, this is what I do. I send to my teachers this letter every year. Dear teacher, I am the survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no man should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers. Children poisoned by educated physicians. Infants killed by trained nurses. Women and children shot and burnt by high school and college graduates. So, I am suspicious of education. My request is, help your students become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, arithmetic are important, but only, only if they serve to make our children more human. To educate, therefore, is to enter into this conversation between the generations, to understand better the physical and social and moral worlds they have come to inherit, to become more fully human persons. It is a process of constant becoming through contact with what others have done or said over the generations. It is to be enabled to exercise judgment on life worth living and to have nurtured the dispositions to live accordingly. The concept of person, therefore, must shape educational policy and practice, and therefore what is distinctively uh, educational research. So something then about educating persons. We train dogs and horses. We train people. But we educate persons. We don't educate donkeys. To recognize someone as a person is to recognize them not as objects to be used for others' purposes, but as ends in themselves, worthy of respect, in that sense, the concept of person is more than a descriptive term for a physical object. It is a moral concept, expressing the recognition of their own distinctive rights, worthiness for respect, capacity to have views of their own. They are ends in themselves, not to be treated as means to an end. This distinction between people as physical objects and people as persons is crucial to our understanding of education and to our criticism of policy and research, which in collapsing the distinction reduces people to mere objects. That depersonalization of people is seen in so many ways in current policy backed by research. Successful learning is equated with what is measurable. Teaching is reduced to producing the behaviors which will gain the required grades in national tests. Priority is given to learners who are borderline between success and failure so that schools can rise in league table. I've seen this operating in some of the poorest districts of London, schools which actually inspired me by what they were doing to educate these young people, but were seen as failing schools because the kids weren't doing well in the test. And the concentration of resources on those who are borderline D and C, and I remember the deputy head saying, I have to devote all my life to this, and it's nothing to do with education. As a result, lost is the focus on the different ways in which children struggle to learn. Little time is given to the personal exploration of values and meaning through poetry, drama and the arts, since such personal exploration does not enter into the specification of grades. 
By contrast, education describes not a neutral process that is instrumental to something extrinsic to that process, getting better grades and so on. It is an initiation into this way of life, into this conversation, which is judged to be intrinsically worthwhile. It is so judged because that way of life is part and parcel of what is meant to be a person and to become one more fully. That in turn entails that ethical considerations and judgments are at the very centre of educational discourse, determining what counts as educational. When I retired from Oxford, I was given a million pounds, not for me personally, uh, by the Nuffield Foundation to do this big six-year survey uh, of 14 to 19 education, the biggest that we'd had for 50 years uh, in Britain. And so one got all this evidence, all these statements, uh, all this research, and one thing or another, but how do you pull all this together in terms of a coherent report? And we did so because we said, what ultimately is the question we should be asking? And that question that we asked in the Nuffield Review was, what counts? as an educated 19-year-old in this day and age. And that really challenged people, and it really got a very constant ethical uh, debate going on uh, within that and within the teachers and within the schools. As with all moral questions, one cannot expect unanimity. Different people, societies will reach different conclusions to that question. But such differences should not preclude critical examination of the often unexamined valued assumptions that undermine educational policy and practice and research. That critical examination requires reflection on what it means to be and to grow as a person. For example, having the knowledge in its different forms for what Dewey referred to as the intelligent management of life, the capabilities to flourish practically, the virtues and moral seriousness for living a distinctively human life, and the sense of community whereby one recognises the interdependence of one for the other. So then, let's move on a little bit now towards the research angle, explaining human activity, linking the social sciences to educational thinking. If then educational thinking is essentially moral, then is it quite separate from the concerns and interests of the social sciences? To educate is to develop the capacity to think, to value, to reason, to appreciate. These are states of mind, mental capacities, distinctively human qualities. And such a mental form of life is logically different from a purely physical form of life, which is the object of the physical sciences and subject to causal explanations. In many respects, the social sciences, from Auguste Comte onwards, followed the example of the physical sciences and sought to provide causal understandings of persons' behavior and of societies. Obvious example of the former was the work of people like B.F. Skinner. More recently, one has seen the importance attached to large-scale and carefully matched experimental and control groups in which a particular intervention within the experimental group, all else being equal, would demonstrate its causal significance, a key to education improvement, so we are told. And there are some excellent examples of the success engendered by such interventions, reading recovery, which I think has already been referred to. However, such explanations have their limitations because of the limitation of such a narrow concept of causality where human situations are concerned. Let me explain. Can there be a science of man? Question asked by A.J. Eyre. Explaining a person's behavior requires reference to intentions, motives, prior understandings through which interventions are in interpreted. I can observe my hand being raised uh, in the same way that I can observe tables, chairs, and so on. But I cannot observe the intentions that lie behind it. What am I intending to do? Is it to wave goodbye? Is it stretching? Is it saying shut up? Whatever it is. You've got to make my intentions. But that itself is not enough. What are the motives for raising my hand? Is it to create a revolution? Is it to, you know, one thing and another? In other words, you can't understand human behavior, human action, without reference to the intentions and the motives. Moreover, you can't even understand the gesture raising your hand uh, without understanding some of the social rules by which other people are going to understand, understand that particular gesture. What I love walking around this campus is everyone smiling at me. Everyone's smiling at me. Someone told me, well, be a bit careful. I think they're probably laughing at you, you know. Uh, you've got to understand the social rules by which you interpret this as laughing or smiling and one thing or another. But, you know, uh, one is able uh, uh, to have that uh, kind of explained. So, therefore, uh, you know, it's difficult to understand individual people, their motives, their intentions, the social rules, and one thing and another. And therefore, one might say, but can anyone really understand me? Aren't I unique? 
Now, my thoughts and my intentions are mine, not yours. They're unique to me. The product of different backgrounds and interactions over time. Uh, through which I see the world and interpret what others say, um, in, 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 and probably differently from other people. That is why policymakers get it wrong. They assume that their detailed interventions will produce the results which they envisaged and hoped for. But what is clear to them, the policymakers, is not necessarily clear to the teachers, or is interpreted by them in a different sort of way, through their particular understandings and so on. On the other hand, one must be careful about this uniqueness fallacy. Each person and each society is unique in some respects, but not in others. I am unique in terms of my exact history, but not unique in terms of my having shared that history to some extent with other social groups. And that social group shares basic human needs with other social groups, needs for food, affection and community. As Winch, Chris's dad, argued in the idea of a social science, we can come to understand from the inside how other societies work and how other people within those societies interpret, generally speaking, the interaction with others. No two languages translate exactly, but there is sufficient approximation to exactness, given the human form of life, for the outsider to enter the way of thinking of others. Hence, generalizations can be made, good old social scientists, but they are inevitably tentative, provisional, open to interpretation, not necessarily applicable to all individuals, some of whom might come from very different backgrounds very, very different ways of seeing the social and the moral worlds. That is why there can be no direct transmission of the conclusions of general statements to the particular case. The teacher always needs to exercise judgment as to whether the general conclusion applies to this particular learner. Nonetheless, that deliberation of the teacher recognizes indirectly the validity of the generalized conclusions which are drawn from the social science research. They take that into account. The contrast between the uniqueness of each individual on the one hand and the large-scale explanation of individual or society, social behaviour on the other is a false dualism. The reconciliation lies in the deliberations of the decision-maker, whether that be policy-maker or the teacher. Moreover, entering into those deliberations or that praxis, though not ex necessarily explicitly, are the educational aims and the values which they hold implicitly or explicitly. So therefore, finally, the teachers as researchers Many of the great philosophers have had something interesting to say about teaching and teachers. Aristotle, Plato, Augustine, Aquinas, Rousseau, Dewey, Wittgenstein, Oakeshott, and so on, each offers insight into the way in which teaching has been and could be conceived. Given quite different philosophical presuppositions about the nature of knowledge, about what is worth learning, about the centrality of experience, above all, about what it means to be human and to become more so. They see a moral dimension to what it means uh, to be a teacher. And I've got this lovely quote of dear John Dewey, who talks about, oh dear, um, I thought I'd got it. Oh, that's right. And John Dewey, in one extravagant moment, he described the teacher as the true prophet and usher in of the kingdom of God. It was really, you know, because I wanted to usher in the kingdom of God that I became a teacher. Right, now... Um, so we've all had this kind of view, which I think. So Oakeshott, I'm sorry, each offers insights into the way in which teaching has been and could be conceived. To understand teaching within this broader ethical and social context provides the basis for challenging how policymakers often conceive of teachers, as did such radical reformers as Illich, Rogers, Dewey. Teaching for Dewey lay in that transformation of experiences which the young learners brought from their families and communities, in the provision of further enriching experiences, and in critical reflection upon them. So understood, the educational journey is helped by, for example, the teacher introducing at appropriate moments those aspects of the inherited wisdom of the race, to use Dewey's words, or Oakeshott's, the voices and the conversation of mankind. It is that interaction between the teacher it, as the inheritor of that knowledgeable about that culture in its different forms, relating that to the children to where they are, and being able, therefore, to be both expert on the kids that they have in their class, but also in that which they can see is, is able to change and transform their lives uh, for uh, the better. This is most important in thinking about what is distinctively educational research. 
We have seen, on the one hand, how engaging thoughtfully in education requires addressing the aims of education. What counts as an educated person in this day and age? We have seen, too, how policy makers and teachers need to take into account what social scientists may say through the various forms of empirical research which bear upon the attempts to improve the education uh, of these young people. But reconciling and integrating these different considerations requires systematic and critical deliberation. Such critical and systematic deliberation is at the heart of educational research. And for that reason, the teacher has to be seen as a researcher in the following sense. The teacher is trying to realize in practice certain educational goals and values. And I'm most grateful for Alec Matthews' paper on this, The Philosophy in Practice. Those goals embody the educational values that he or she is committed to, though often only implicitly. The reflective teacher, and thanks Rohit for his uh, uh, paper on this, the reflective teacher will constantly try to articulate those goals in the context of his or her practice. And no doubt in the light of what others say, what the teachers see to be of educational values for the learners in his or her care will evolve through criticism. Furthermore, in implementing those educational aims, the deliberations of the reflective teacher will take into account what researchers, social scientists, have said. Not slavishly, because as I argued above, what is generally applicable may not be so for these particular children in this situation. For example, generalizations about the benefits of the phonic approach to teaching of reading would not apply to children with glue ear. And at 30% of the kids in Oxfordshire have suffered from glue ear, which prevents you being able to distinguish sound very clearly. So therefore, the phonic method would not be appropriate for those children. All that applies to the reflective teacher. That is not quite the same as the teacher as the researcher, but a precursor to it. What turns reflection into research is, one, clarifying as precisely as possible the aims of educating these learners, the knowledge and practical capabilities that are valued, the issues of social concern that impact on them, the sense of personal worth which each is striving to acquire, and two, gathering evidence which would support the claim that such aims have been implemented or not, in which case new approaches have to be found, tested, refined in the light of further experience. Part of that refining would lie in openness to criticism of others, other teachers, and the feedback from the learners. The essence of the research, therefore, is the clarity of the thesis, the claim being made, the evidence which is relevant to challenging that claim, and the openness to the critical scrutiny of the thesis and of the evidence provided. For this to happen, teachers within or across schools need to become supportive communities of researchers. Knowledge grows through criticism, as Popper argued, and so one needs to create the sort of communities where criticism can flourish, where the thesis can be tested, hopefully survive, or, where that is not the case, be refined. This is so important because the natural human instinct is to avoid criticism and to avoid exposure to any evidence which makes one question what one believes to work. So by way of conclusion, educational thinking, whether that be in policy or in practice, raises questions which traditionally have been within the province of philosophy, ethical questions about the aims of education and what is worth learning, about the nature of knowledge to be acquired, about the relation of private to the public good. Failure to address these questions leads to a defective policy and practice and research. That philosophical questioning often begins with the puzzlement over what is meant when policies and practices are advocated, with the realization that there is ambiguity in what is said, and that at the center of such ambiguity are assumptions about values or about what it means to know or about what counts as an educated person. Furthermore, key to such educational questioning should be the teachers, who far from being the deliverers of the curriculum, must be the curriculum thinkers. And furthermore, philosophically aware and questioning, they, the teachers, need to engage in the research which will enable them to teach better. Thank you very much. We're going deaf, so she can't understand what we're saying. And the real secret of marital bliss is that we can't really engage in intelligent conversations. So please, if you're going to please. 
Um, we also agreed uh, up here that uh, you should limit your questions to about a hundred of the first time you put up your hand, uh, and uh, you can always put up your hand a second time if you have another hundred. Uh, but uh, seriously, uh, one question and then you can get back in line, because a lot of people want to ask questions, and the two speakers in this part of the session are going to answer one question before we go on to another. Uh, just to uh, reduce the memory load uh, on us aging, uh, aging guys down here. So, uh, put up your hand and I'll interpret that as an intention to ask a question. Yes. Thank you very much, sir, for a wonderful talk. Oh, just a uh, query, small one. Are we focusing on the reflective aspect of the teacher because we are conceptualizing humans as homo cognitus. And what was that, those two words? Are we homo cognitus? Yeah, right. Because sometimes we conceptualize humans as homo economicus or homo communicatus. Yes. So are we conceptualizing humans as homo cognitus? Right. That's why we are focusing so much on reflection. Yes, yes. Uh, can I, uh, uh, the, look, clearly, they are involved in that activity which traditionally could say is helping these young people to live a better human life. That requires reflecting on what it means to be human. And th there are many dimensions of this, what it is to be human. Obviously, there's being a person who is going to be able to uh, live a life in which they're going to be useful, earn a living, meet the economic uh, needs and so on, in which they're going to be able to enjoy, you know, relationships with other people, in which they are going to be able to deal with uh, stresses and lives and so on. But also, what is distinctively education is that in which they are able to appreciate their own human dignity and value through what we have gained. Now, different people, uh, youngsters, are going to be able to appreciate this at different levels of sophistication. When I first started teaching uh, in Camden Town in London, uh, I uh, finished my PGCE. I wrote to the head teacher of the school uh, that I had got my first job in, saying, please, you're to give me my timetable for next year so that I can spend the summer vacation preparing my lessons. Letter comes back from the head teacher, which says, we don't know what your timetable is going to be, but if you come in very early, the first day of term, we will give you uh, your timetable. All right, so my first disillusion delusion about education started to come in. Went in the first day of term, the head teacher said, uh, what do you do at the university, Mr. Bring? And I said, philosophy, I thought so, I'm giving you the slow learners. So I became, therefore, the teacher of 1X. It was called 1X because they were regarded as so slow, they hadn't reached letter X in the alphabet and therefore wouldn't know they were slow learners, all right? So what do I teach? What is it to educate the slow learners? Mr. O'Connell comes in and tells them, You've got to work hard, because unless you're going to work hard, you will end up as street cleaners, dustbin collectors, and one thing and another. Most of these kids, their parents were street clean dustmen. And I suddenly thought, is education something about helping these young people to have disdain and contempt for their parents? What happens if they, they what is it to educate street cleaners? People are going to do the humble jobs and so on. And that's a question which is never asked, but which actually had an effect upon me. So therefore, for these, educating them to become human, helping them to develop that thing, there may be limitations in which they can benefit from the great literature and the science and so on, but a good teacher can put them in touch with the sort of literature, the sort of art, the sort of drama that's going to enable them to live more fulfilled human lives. So there's no just one thing about being human. It's a range of different things, capacity to think in a particular way, to behave, to think seriously about life, about what a good life is, and about the important issues that affect society and so on. Teachers' own thinking, whether they are good teacher, bad teacher, ugly teacher, doesn't matter, because I consider all teachers have some attribute some meaning or aim for the aims of education. Yes. Then in philosophy of education I have for the past three days, either it is given by the giver of the education or it is run by 
others like values and aims, etc., or it is uh, an outside who is trying to the that is uh, or what is that? So, is it possibility of bringing teachers' thinking to generate knowledge? Good. Well, thank you very much indeed. Can I just say that there is a real difficulty? I mean, you know, I think the research I've just, in, the, in a book I've just written, really researched this very hard, the amount now that schools are forced against what they would see to be the best to prepare kids for tests, which they know are not really anything to do with education and so on. I suppose one can exaggerate because, you know, that the effects of that, because I just know, I go to schools a lot, I know... Uh, the many teachers who really do maintain these ideals of what it is to educate one thing, though they find it difficult often to put those because of the kind of political context in which uh, they are working. But if I might just go a little bit back in time, and I don't want to romanticise the past too much, but when I started teaching in London, it was the time when they were just about to raise the school leaving age from, uh, uh, 15, uh, to, no, from 14 to 15. And, you know, lots of schools are slightly in panic, you know, how are we going to manage all these kids from one thing or another? And there were these teacher centres in which we were able to meet other teachers. I was teaching English to these kids, what am I going to teach them, how am I going to do it? And I met other teachers of English, and we, it was through that mutual talking with each other about what the aims of this teaching English to these particular children were, to the kind of literature and poetry which would be available and so on, that I was evolving both, both my own views about what is educationally worthwhile for these young people, as well as the ways in which those views might be implemented through the practice I'm doing. So I think that what one has got to make sure is that schools themselves become, and, and schools linked with other schools, become centres of that kind of thinking which I call teacher-based research and so on, that might seem to some being a bit exaggerated, but in which they themselves are able to maintain their integrity in thinking about this, supported by other teachers who will be critical, but critical in a supportive sense, which enables people to expose what it is that they believe uh, and what have you. And I think therefore one's got to start talking about schools themselves and supporting schools to enable them to engage in that kind of exercise. Now, I don't think, you see, a lot had happened. When I started teaching and uh, so on, no, there was nothing that enabled me, really, to challenge some of the preconceived ideas I had about kids' capacity to learn uh, and what have you. Uh, there was no, uh, my philosophical training did not translate into my asking these sorts of questions. Uh, and I think on the whole, the school that I started in, there was none of that thinking whatsoever. I moved to another school, uh, Haverstock uh, uh, School uh, in uh, London, where there was that kind of thinking going on, where there was real questioning about the racism and about the multi-ethnic kind of thing that going on within the school and all that. And that, for the first time, in my mind, started raising these questions in my mind. It was through the context of a group of people that were raising these fundamental questions about aims and values in the context of what are we going to do with these particular children. That's what one has got to create. Thank you very much for your uh, lecture. As you hear, I am speaking loudly and slowly. <laughs> uh, uh, my context is Sweden, as you know, and I think that I have become more and more concerned as to the fact, um, in the Swedish discourse oh, yeah. on education now, along with performativity and instrumentality, there is a rising um, discourse on discipline, something that disappeared 50 years ago from the educational scene in Sweden, but is coming back uh, as one uh, is so goal-oriented one is becoming more and more concerned about discipline being a very important part of education. Can I have your take on this? On discipline? I mean, you mean uh, behavioural discipline as opposed to discipline as a subject and, and, and what have you. Uh, well, um, you see, um, I mean, if one goes back uh, to, to Dewey here, I mean, Dewey really did see discipline. You can either have it imposed from outside in which case you don't really believe in what it is you're doing and it disappears as soon as actually the rod or whatever disappears. Or you can see discipline as something which is somehow uh, internally developed because the people come to see 
uh, the importance, the values, and so on, of behaving in a particular way in a community. Now, I think that, I mean, one of the things that Dewey was so keen about was the common school, and the common school was one where people from different uh, context, different neighbourhoods, different ethnic things, and come together. And a central part of that coming together was them being able, in a disciplined way, to be able to kind of talk to each other rather than the reacting in a violent way, one from another. Now, I'm working now, I was up in a school in North Oxford, which serves about, I mean, the class that I saw teaching uh, of uh, 10 year olds, of this class of 28, uh, 11. Uh, were coming from really dysfunctional uh, families with real domestic violence. Ten were on the uh, child protection uh, thing. One had had a parent just murdered. I mean, this was in the poorest part of Oxford, very, very poor, where the car factory, the uh, uh, Morrises and so on, it reduced from 175,000 workers now to 25,000. The social disadvantage in that part of Oxford is one of the poorest parts in the country. And I saw the way in which the, 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 these kids coming from violent families, violent neighbourhoods, and one thing or another. The concentration in this school was to enable them to work together, to think together. They were developing all sorts of strategies. Uh, they were developing all sorts of strategies whereby these youngsters were now able to relate to each other, were discussing their personal problems, and one thing or another. So I think that properly taught, with the right sort of values, you can get this kind of discipline, this capacity to d disagree with each other without going and doing it violently, understanding. I could go into this in a long way. I'm very much committed to this. So I've seen schools, this poorest school in the poorest area of London, which was declared to be a failing school by Ed Balls when he was Secretary of State for Education, was to my mind inspiring by what the teachers were doing and bringing discipline that's internal to these kids. There was one chap who came from Ghana, he'd been thrown out of his previous school for misbehaviour, and he said to me, this 16-year-old said, this is a good school, they act out what they preach in terms of fairness and so on. So I have seen schools that have transformed the lives in disciplined sense of young people because of the way in which the teachers develop these particular skills. It's all there theoretically in John Dewey. Yeah, mm, thank you. Uh, you'd mentioned, uh, Dr. Pring, that if no one can, uh, that no one can predict educational outcomes, and uh, so then no one, what our education? no one could can really predict educational yeah. outcome. So my question is then, how can one effectively measure or assess the impact of education? Right. Or um, should one? Well, I think educational judgment, and I think in order to do that then I think that one has got to set out what to you seem to be the criteria against which you, as a school, would like to see yourself judged. Now, if you're working in the two schools that I have mentioned, they would say that some of the criteria is that these young people come to school, settle down without any kind of discipline problems, uh, that they are able to talk freely and openly with each other, there aren't sort of fights in the... You know, that would be one of the sort of criteria by which I would like to be judged, have my school judged. Uh, I would like to say that, of course, you do have to assess these youngsters to say exactly, you know, uh, have they got particular learning difficulties, are, are they, and so on. And you'd want to have assessments whereby you can say, yes, they have made progress. They are able now to read better than when they first came. I don't want to ditch all that kind of thing, not at all. But you don't want to have the kind of assessments by which it's the assessment which determine the educational judgment, rather than the educational judgment which determines the sort of tests uh, which are appropriate. And if you do make that educational judgment, you will, of course, have it that they can read. I'd also want to say, is it not that just they have the capacity to read, that actually they're interested in reading books, you know, and not just being able to read, you know, for the test. So I think a school and school districts have got to be themselves engaged in saying, how do we want to be judged? And I'd like to think their schools are set in a sufficient democratic kind of context that they're able to share this with the parents and with the wider community, who also will have a voice in this. When you come to the secondary schools, local employers want to say, well, of course, we also want young people to be emerging from the schools who are able, you know, to do certain sorts of work, to behave 
get to school, uh, to work on time, you know, all that kind of thing. But you'd work out a series of criteria by which you want to say, we are transforming these kids to live more human lives, and these are the ways in which we can actually say this is to be judged. The school which is called Failing by Mr. Uh, uh, Balls uh, was, to me, one of the most inspiring schools I have ever been in. Uh, I'm attempting to connect a couple of things from your lecture. So here, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you were talking about deliverology and delivering, what about deliverology and delivering yeah. delivery yeah. systems, and you were also talking of how in logic, tr truth, and sorry, language, tr truth, and logic, the book, uh, the role of modality or mode in its relation to truth. So I'm looking for your perspectives on the implications of the information and communication technology, like uh, television, yes. internet, mobile phones. And uh, again, I'm looking at the orality literacy debate to give you a little bit of uh, insight into this. And I'm looking at responsive versus reflective. This whole idea of universal simultaneity instinct that internet or uh, these yes. mobile technologies providers seem to have more of a responsive criteria than a reflective criteria. I want your perspectives on this. Well, Thank yes. I, can I just say that um, I've reached the stage uh, in life which I, you know, I, I don't even know how to use a mobile phone, you know. Uh, uh, I don't even know how to use a mobile phone. So I'm not person, the best person to... Uh, oh. So Actually, I think you would be the best person because the perspectives I get are from users of this. So I'm looking for somebody who's outside this too. Okay, I'm totally outside. But I mean, I do think that, look, what is it to educate a person? What's an educator in this day and age? And this day and age is shaped so much by technology, the improvement in some respects of communication, the speed of communication, the new social networks which develop as a result of this. And therefore, this does make real demands upon what now counts as an educated person, about how that can be used wisely, about how people, I mean, there's a lot of research now in Britain about the bullying that takes place through the social networking and so on, of Facebook and uh, Twitter and that kind of thing, real bullying, especially the way in which girls get harmed and hurt uh, by this sort of way. Now, given that this is the social and context in which we're living, then that the effect of technology in terms of communication and how people see themselves and how they relate to each other is absolutely bad. One of the kind of problems, actually, with our schools is that most of the young people at them are much more closely acquainted with and knowledgeable about this than they are of the generation of teachers who are actually teaching them. But certainly what counts as an educated person in this day and age must be have reference to how they use wisely, benefit from, see the dangers of, etc. the whole question of information technology.